Hello and welcome to another amazing episode of Agency Automators. Today, I'm starting us off. Jordan's a little bit late. You know, things in Toronto today are a little bit crazy, but I'm super stoked today to have Rachel Anderson, friend and guru from Deep Crawl on the call with us. How are you doing today, Rachel? Doing well. It was rainy earlier, but now the sun's come out, so I'm happy. I was totally going to ask you before I forgot to, if winter is like coming to you or if it's still in the far off distant future. It's confusing because this weekend it was nearly 70 degrees and it was like, it was hot outside yesterday. I was sweating. And then today I woke up and it was in the forties and rainy and it's supposed to be like that all week. So I think maybe it's now winter. I don't know. It snowed last week and melted immediately. I, Virginia just doesn't know what the weather is supposed to do. Well, here in Colorado, it thinks that it's winter. You can kind of see that it's all blown out in my window. And that's because there's snow on all of the roads, all the sidewalks, all the houses. So it's just white. And I guess if I went like that, you might be able to see something. I don't know. <laughs> Not so much. I tried. No. <laughs> oh, man, that's so funny. Okay, so Rachel, what are we gonna be chatting about today? Tell everybody what to expect. Yeah, so I have built a dashboard using the PageSpeed Insights API uh, so that you can look on a segment or even a URL basis to see how you're performing for Core Web Vitals in particular. So we're going to be showing that off. Ooh, okay, Core Web Vitals. So for SEOs that have been living in a cave for the past eight months, why is that important? It's important because in May, that's going to be incorporated into the algorithm update. So you need to know about how Core Web Vitals may be affecting your website because Google's gathering that data right now. So it's important. Uh, you can't just put it off till May because you might be screwed at that point. Awesome. And it looks like, oh boy, here he is. We get to give him some- Join the party. Hey everyone, sorry about that. I had a client call that ran really late. Did you uh, close some big business, I'm hoping? Did you no, stack bills? <laughs> no, it, it, was, it was a weekly meeting with a client of, of mine. Um, so you know how it is. They ask one question and then one turns into 10 and sure. just go down a rabbit hole. Oh, yeah. I live in rabbit holes. That's, that's how I make a living. <laughs> okay, cool. So, uh, Rachel... Um, just told us a little bit about what we're going to be looking at, which is a really cool Core Web Vitals dashboard. Uh, Rachel, I forgot to ask, can you tell everybody a little bit about you, a little bit about Deep Crawl if they haven't heard about it? Yeah, so um, I'm a senior SEO analyst at Deep Crawl, where I work on the professional services team. So I work with a bunch of other really talented SEOs, and we worked with uh, work with clients to build custom solutions and work on them with projects. So at the basic level, what we're doing is looking at their crawls monthly or fortnightly and looking for issues and then working with them to get those fixed. But then for a lot of clients, we work on special projects um, and those are typically dictated by them in some way, but then we're always coming up with creative solutions to solve those problems. And this is actually one of those creative solutions. It sounds like you have kind of a mad scientist role too. Yeah, we have um, a good percentage of our time that's supposed to be spent on learning and development. And typically that learning and development, well, not typically, it's always supposed to align somehow with things that our, our clients need. So uh, whatever we can do to automate things, that's, that's the kind of stuff we're working on. Um, so when I started at DeepCrawl, I actually didn't know any Python. And this year, I mean, you can't work alongside Ruth Everett and not learn some Python. So um, I've been learning a lot of Python with her and now um, have been experimenting with SQL. Um, so yeah, we, we have a lot of time for learning new things and applying that to our work. If I'm not mistaken, you started taking a Udemy course. You told Jordan about the course and he bought it. 
Mm -hmm. Jordan told me about the course and I bought it. So we got to share that Udemy link. Uh, in I'm going to have to start video. asking for commission on this. <laughs> I know. <seriously. laughs> but uh, one of our past guests, Cody West, was talking about S talking about SQL as like a foundational skill that he thinks would be the core skill when making a technical SEO hire. Any thoughts mm -hmm. on that? That's interesting. Um, I mean, I think it would depend on what you need that person to do in a role because I was a great technical SEO before I knew any SQL, but my main motivation for it is that I'm using BigQuery a lot with Google Data Studio and when you have, you know, millions and millions of rows and, you know, 300 columns, that gets really slow and overwhelms Google Data Studio. Um, so knowing some SQL to be able to limit what you're pulling in is really important. So I'm going like this because I'm like, what kind of data source has 300 columns? Well, so the first one that I, it, it's not 300 columns, but it's definitely over... 100, I mean, deep crawl by itself has well over 100 columns. Um, but the first piece of data that actually made me be like, oh, shoot, I got to learn SQL was working with Authority Labs. Um, so Traject data. Um, I got a large keyword data set from them. And the problem there was it's a lot of columns, but it was like 56 million rows. I was like, um, okay, I'm going to have to figure something out. <laughs> was it partitioned by date? Um, no, not how we were pulling it in. Well, okay, so I can make it that way. So yeah. essentially, we're pulling from an Amazon bucket, and then we're pulling it into cloud, and then I'm creating tables in BigQuery based out off of the Google Cloud storage. Mm -hmm. So... I have actually met with like engineers on the deep crawl team to help me figure out how to set this up. I'm like, great, this is now turned into database management somehow. I don't know what I'm doing. Right? Oh my goodness. Okay, so we yeah. started going down a rabbit hole, speaking of rabbit holes. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so we were talking about core web vitals. Yeah. I feel like in our agency, it's our area of focus as an SEO team between now and the end of March. I feel mm -hmm. like all of our internal training and internal tool building is going to really focus on that. Outside of like data pipelining, that's going to be our, our other main area of focus is to build out the toolkits necessary to measure it and to uh, plan technical fixes. Does cool. that align with what you would recommend for agencies? Yeah, I mean, you need to be paying attention to Core Web Vitals. If you are not familiar with Core Web Vitals and what the algorithm update is going to mean, I would recommend watching Jamie Indigo's talk on it. Um, she did a deep crawl webinar last week, week before last, about what, it, what each of the metrics mean, how you can measure it for yourself, and like how to fix things. So I, I think that that's the most valuable resource of like everything all in one place that I've seen so far. It was really, really comprehensive. Okay, and we'll, involve, we'll include that as a link on the video too so that people can find it. Okay, killer. So look, Ma, I built something, right? Can yeah. You, can you tell us about it and then show us? And I can, I think yeah. you'll have, you should have screen sharing permissions here. Okay, cool. Let me, I'll show you what I've had for a while. So um, my team for a while has used the, is it called the Crux connector? What, what connector is this that we're using? Uh, oh, I can't, I can't access the data source over here, but it's the, the Crux data source that you can just use. It's not, I mean, it's not proprietary. It's, it's from Google. And so what we have done in the past is we set up data sources for a client and their competitors. And what the data gives you is information um, for each of these metrics over time for each of the full domains. The problem is this is for the full domain. So if you're curious about your CLS on product pages, 
you can't get that. You are like, oh no, a lot of my pages have poor CLS. What will I do? Well, you don't even know which of these pages. You don't know which pages are causing it. So um, you could then start manually pasting a bunch of URLs into the Lighthouse um, report, but that, that takes forever yep. and is not a great solution for monitoring things over time. So um, I was talking with uh, Jeff over at Wirecutter and he was talking about how he was using Screaming Frog to pull in things from the PageSpeed Insights, or I'm sorry, uh, the Lighthouse API. And um, he was using that and then uploading things to BigQuery. And I was like, oh, that's, that's a lot of work. I wonder if I could do this more easily with deep crawl. <laughs> and so that's what I proceeded to do is, um, so we have this, this report, which is great. And it shows each like a client and competitors. Um, this is just our template. So we put in a bunch of uh, fast fashion brands. And then we have this last page that kind of compares them, their good metrics, and you could do this for their poor or average metrics to each other as well. But what we've been doing is tacking on this page at the end, which actually is pulling data from the Lighthouse API. Um, and you can start to segment by device type, so mobile or desktop, and then particular segments. So this is actually wire cutters data because I was talking with Jeff and I got curious. And so this is what I started experimenting with. And they have a pretty easy site structure. So they have uh, review pages, and then they have some categories, and then just all URLs. So we built this report, and what it's pulling in is lab data. So what this is, is when we are crawling, or when at the time that it's crawled, what the score is for each of these metrics. And then there's RUM data, which is real user metrics, or real user measurements, depending on what you're reading. And we can start to see those over time. And then the final thing in here is actually deep crawls metrics, which is another version of lab metrics, um, but they're going to be a little bit different um, because they're based on our server um, and us accessing it at the time. The other thing with deep crawl metrics is that it's based on the desktop viewport size. So things like CLS on mobile, you can't really get an accurate read on that without going and using the PageSpeed or the Lighthouse API. I keep calling it the PageSpeed Insights API. I get confused. There's too many tools out there, too many so words. Many APIs, yeah. Yeah. Don't worry, PageSpeed actually gives you Lighthouse data as I just recently found out. Yeah, see, this is why it's so confusing to me. I have these conversations, I'm like, okay, so there's cracks in Lighthouse and PageSpeed Insights. You know, how do I get the data from, what does it mean? Like, it, it gets really complicated. <laughs> um, so yeah, so this is what we built. Um, there's totally ways to make it better, but I think as a minimum viable product, that this is great. I'm able to segment by uh, mobile versus desktop, uh, particular segments, and then date ranges. I started, I, I'm just pulling the past 30 days here, but we started pulling this data for wire cutter back in the middle of October. So I could go back to there as well. So I have it for CLS, LCP, and then FID. Um, first input delay is actually just a real user metric. You can't get this in lab data. You can use total blocking time as a supplement, um, but there's no way to get first input delay without getting the real user metric data. Uh, right now, I'm just, I have this segmented to the mobile report, but we can see like mobile and desktop side by side. I'm scared to change any of the settings on here because it's been running really, really slow today. <laughs> mm. So where is this data? Is it in BigQuery? Is it in a sheet? Like, where is it? Yeah, so this is actually using the deep crawl native Google Data Studio connector. So that's something that I want to improve this. Um, we do have a BigQuery table option as well. So my next step with this for clients is to actually enable that BigQuery table for them and then rebuild this report with 
BigQuery as the source uh, because it's going to be much faster. What is nice about this though is, so for creating this, the reason I wanted to use the Google Data Studio connector is that I knew that I could pull in custom extractions um, easily with the Google Data Studio connector we had. So what I did is when we developed the script, I, uh, we worked with Dave Smart to create the script that we used for this. And I asked him to bucket them into fast, average, and slow based on the Google's requirements for these uh, so that I could have custom extractions. One was for fast um, LCP, one's for average LCP, and one's for slow LCP, and so on. Um, and then it makes it really, really easy to actually connect this. Wow. Yeah, so would you like me to show you show you the script? Can I ask you something really quick? Yeah, sure. So when I talked to uh, Dale from Jepto, he was telling me about their Data Studio connector. And what people have told me about it is, oh, I love it, but it's slow. Mm -hmm. and he said to me, what people don't realize is the reason it's slow is that we're querying the data in real time and then presenting it to them because we don't store it anywhere. Yeah. And I'm assuming that the same thing's happening on your side where your tool is running is actually making the query, right? It's not. Yeah, actually. So when we were developing the connector back in, I guess, I guess it was May and June. I don't remember what time is anymore. Um, I actually brought down deep crawl temporarily because I was requesting so much data all at once in Google Data Studio and there hadn't been anything, uh, I guess it was rate limiting. There wasn't any of that put in place. And so I was making so many requests that I, <laughs> I brought down the tool temporarily. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna add QA testing to my resume. Um, and we got that fixed. So additionally, in addition to it actually like doing this in real time, it's being rate limited. So I don't bring down deep crawl. Um, and so no one else accidentally does that either because you we could. Need to clarify this for a second. So the best I fucked up story that we've had so far was Jordan DDoSing his client. Oh, Are no. you correctly that you broke deep crawl? Okay, broke is making it sound worse than it was. I just slowed every single crawl to just nothing, essentially. And like everything just kind of got stuck no. temporarily, temporarily until product was like, I think something's wrong. And then they looked at it. They're like, I think Rachel broke it. <laughs> oh, that's right. I read, I was reading through the guidelines and all your like, things that you say to clients and it's like, we have a 99.99999% uptime guarantee asterisk. And then I looked at the, unless Rachel <laughs> touches stuff. <laughs> I mean, it was up and like, you could start crawls, you could look at crawls, but like as far as actually crawling sites and yeah. finalizing like processing data, yeah, I, I definitely, I, I was using all of our resources for that. Um, wow. So yeah, that's another reason why it's slow. And why it would be better if um, if I use the BigQuery connector option, which is fine. I just haven't I haven't had the time, or honestly, the, the inspiration to do that. Yeah, yet. right. <laughs> okay, I got us off track again. I'm sorry. Uh, no, okay. Want to? Okay, so we have this killer report. What's yeah. next? Yeah. So, like I said. Um, we work with Dave Smart sometimes because he is very smart and he's really fun to work with. Uh, and we had him create this nice little um, script for us. And essentially what we're doing is gathering the data and then bucketing it in different ways. So like I said before, LCP is gonna be fast, medium, slow. Um, and then a lot of this at the end is I also asked to grab raw numbers because in addition to just like bucketing it, I wanted to make sure that it was bucketing it correctly, but also if I wanted to export this and do some fancy things in Python, I could do that or I could ask Ruth to help me do that because she is the Python was on my team. Um, 
So this is the nice little thing we started with. It's really easy to use. So you gotta generate your key. And also it is the PageSpeed Insights API, not Lighthouse. I'm using the wrong words, yep. I'm gonna give myself a pass and say it's Monday. Um, but yeah, so the PageSpeed Insights API is what we're using. It's really easy to generate a key. You click the button and it generates you a key. Um, I've already generated a key for myself, so that's why it's being weird about it. And there are limitations on this. So I believe it's 25,000 queries a day that you can do. So if you have a site that you know is a million URLs, you're going to need to crawl a subset of those pages. Um, and that's actually what I'm doing for clients. I'm setting up subset list and I'm calling those URLs every day. So once you have that key, it's literally just pasting the, the key in here. And then we take this full script and I had set up this new project over here, run some URLs in it. We have this setting in deep crawl that allows us to put in custom JavaScript. So all I do is copy and paste that here. The other thing that we're able to do is say whether or not we want it to the mobile or desktop version. So the mobile version is going to be pulling the mobile results and the desktop is going to be pulling the desktop results. But we can only do one of those at a time. Essentially, there's only so much time uh, when we're crawling the page that we're rendering things. And so if we try to do them both at once, we'd probably end up with a lot more null data sets because it wouldn't have enough time to collect the data. So what I've actually done in the case of this report is I've created two different projects in Deep Crawl, one that's pulling the mobile data, one that's pulling the desktop. So I can go back and forth between these. And then if I really wanted to get fancy, I could probably blend the data together and show you like the comparison between them, but I also haven't done that yet. Mm. Yeah, so that in the case easy of, in DBT, as long as the columns are the same. Yeah, I mean, it's, re, it's returning the exact same thing. So let me show you. So here's the wire cutter one that I've been doing. Uh, all the extractions. Uh, here we go. All the custom extractions. I'll just do the overview page here. So another thing that's interesting is sometimes you just don't get any results on pages and that's okay it happens sometimes like i mentioned before there's only so much time that deep crawl spends rendering things and sometimes we don't get the result in enough time um but in most cases you can see here that we're getting somewhere around 916 of these urls with data returned um so you can see here all this raw data and I, they're just set up in custom extractions, which I'll show you over here. So these custom extractions are looking, so the script returns information and it puts it in this format. And so this is regex and we're looking to find, we're just looking for the results that the API returns us. Got it. Yep. What was with the three colons? I'm not familiar with that pattern. That yeah. is the pattern that we use on a lot of things. Um, oh. When we're, we have a lot of little JavaScript snippets that we use yeah. to pull data from different things. Uh -huh. And this is the format that we've used on a lot of things. I There may be something more to it, but as far as I know, it's just the one that I see a lot at Deep Crawl and I just use it. So it's just a regex pattern. Okay, cool. Thank God. I was like, oh. Have Is I this something new I need to learn? No. Yeah, totally. I was like, oh no, what am I missing? Yeah, so you can see down here, it's looking like down here, it's just looking for what the number value is. So it can be anything within those parentheses, that's what it's returning because these are the number values. But then for these, it's actually looking to it for it to be bucketed as fast. And so only the URLs that are getting the fast bucket results will be logged under this um, custom extraction. Hmm. Yep. 
So there's some things that you could do with that, this here in deep crawl. So we could see, um, if I go into the new app view, I don't know. Oh, I do have segments set up. Um, I can see like what segments tend to have good CLS. So the review pages tend to have good CLS, although I'd need to see what fraction of pages from this you know, crawl were review pages. I can actually do that too in the old pages report. So we can do some of this stuff just natively in the tool. Yes, yeah, so it's 610 review pages here. But um, it's a little bit, I think it's a little bit clunky because it's a bunch of custom extractions and you can't do nice visuals of pie charts and things. And to be fair, I guess I haven't made any nice visuals of pie charts over here yet either, but I could. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that's why I wanted to do it and a little bit of how, and you could totally just use this in deep crawl. It's not, it's not hard to set up. I can give you the script. You just need to generate your own API key. In fact, I have a nice little note here about getting your own dang API key, which, um, I didn't realize was going to show up quite like that, but I'll take it. It's fine. <laughs> Ooh, so does this mean that you guys have two scripts now in deep crawl SEO? Not just Josh's script about uh, mixed content? Um, I think his mixed content script is in our external GitHub, but this isn't our internal one, but I could, I could totally make it in the external one. Oh, it's, okay, cool. Yeah, it's probably not going to be terribly helpful to anyone running a different crawler than deep crawl because I don't know how many crawlers have a JavaScript snippet section that you can put in. I don't think, I don't think Screaming Frog or Site Bulb have that capability. Got it. But, yeah. I mean, the thing that I was actually, I mean, I love this script, but I was getting a little giddy because I saw one, two, three, at least four levels of a GitHub repo that I wasn't familiar with that I hadn't seen <laughs> before. Cause I remember deep crawl SEO as Josh's username that he had the mixed content in. Yeah. And I definitely was in that, in that repo like last week. So I was like, wait, I didn't see this. <laughs> yeah. 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 We have the, uh, we have the, the super secret side, uh, which, generally just means, I don't know, Not who knows, much. who knows what modifications you're going to need to make to it before it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. huh. yeah. Yeah, we have this and then we also have a bunch of scripts and an Excel sheet too. So it's, it's all over the place. We could probably get a little bit more organized for sharing um, yeah. because our team loves to share because why not? Like that's what makes the community better. Yeah. Yeah, that's I mean, that's I've seen on Twitter over the past two weeks, 10 days, whatever people talking about how zooming is like how people meet people in 2020. And I can't talk enough about the value of both sharing code and concepts and ideas and problem solving techniques and also the value of connecting through Zoom. I feel like that's what's been getting me through the pandemic that sounds really trite i'm sure but that's how i feel i mean yeah you know, like early outside my window i mean my world is bigger than what i see you know and this has helped me make it smaller and connecting everybody yeah at the beginning of the pandemic jr oaks had a couple of group zoom calls that i joined in on yeah. and one of those happened to fall on my birthday and i was like super bummed because I usually have some friends over or like go to dinner with them. And I was like, I don't get to do any of these things this year. Um, and so, yeah, jumping on a Zoom call with a bunch of other nerds was incredible. I loved it. I was like, oh, okay, this starts to possibly make up for it. I don't know. I'm learning something new. That's fun. This is a proxy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Maybe one day I'll see people in real life again. That would be nice. His code is pretty clean. Um, and I can understand it. The only thing that, that I was nervous about when I looked at it were the three dots. I was like, Ooh, he's using an interesting, interesting mm -hmm. patterns with the all caps followed by the dots. I was like, shit, is that like some 
way of creating JavaScript classes or something that I just don't know about. I feel dumb. <laughs> I don't think so. This is something that we use in some scripts. Uh, like I said, there could be some hidden meaning behind it. Um, we can we can ask Dave. Um, but as far as I know, no. Okay. Yeah. Really cool. Um, yeah, I can't. I don't write JavaScript, so this. That's why I asked for his help. <laughs> okay, so step one, grab the code. Step two, yep. paste it into deep crawl. Uh -uh. Step one, generate an API. Key. Oh, sorry. Because <laughs> you got to get your own dang API yeah. using this nice link right here. So yeah. <laughs> oh, I got you. Step one, make an API key. Step, Step two, two, paste API it in there. Yeah. Step three, paste the whole code block into deep crawl. Step four, run deep, deep crawl. Uh, step, step four is going to be setting up the custom extractions, which are kind of tedious. Yeah. It's, but it's just copying and pasting. Um, let me go back over here to my settings. It's just copying and pasting a, a bunch of the three dots, essentially, in whatever order is helpful for you. Can you share that with us so that I can add that to the article around this? Because I feel like yeah. it's going to be necessary to help people actually execute. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's simple. I can totally share that with you. Uh, I also, the, this is the first one I set it up on. Like I said, this is the one I've been collecting data on the longest. And I set it up so it was like CLS, um, lab data, LCP, lab data. And then I jumped on to FID rum data and then I just didn't like the order I pulled these in. I thought it was confusing. So when I started doing this for some clients, I switched up the order. So like the CLS is all bucketed together. LCP is all bucketed together because that just made more sense to me when I was messing around with the connector. It was just really confusing to look at it the way I initially set it up. But yeah, I'll send it all over and then you can write it in whatever order you want. What, um, what, I, I'm starting to look at things through a different metric or a different yeah. way, a different lens and, um, insights, actions, business intelligence, or business impact. So, you know, which is another fancy way of saying, so what, like, yeah. what are the insights that you've gleaned in using this tool? Yeah. So obviously this is a demo set. And so I haven't gleaned a ton of insights from this one. Um, but for one of my clients, they are e-commerce and they have category pages and they have product pages and they have store pages. And so what I've done is I've set up segments for each of those and I can look at performance for each of these metrics for segments. And so I can start to see, oh, shoot, your you know category pages have a terrible CLS score but your product pages are fine. So then I can start to dig in and see what it is that needs to be changed on those category pages to fix them. So it, it helps me narrow down where I need to spend more time actually looking in dev tools in the performance report to figure out what, what's going on. That was going to be my next question because you and I have been on a call and we were looking at the performance tab. Yeah. Okay. So the actions that you're taking are going into the performance tab and seeing how, how the pages for that segment or template are loading. Yeah. So like I could go, let's just go to wire cutter electronics. Hopefully this link is good. Hey, look, and I can inspect. Ooh, we can look on this tiny, tiny phone. Um, and then what we'll do is use the performance report. And this shows us a lot of things. It does take it a minute to run though. I love this that you're showing us this. Say what? I love that you're showing us this, Rachel. Yeah. Well, so one thing that I didn't realize for the longest time is that this performance report will actually tell you what is the largest contemporary paint on the page. And I didn't know this. And then I was talking to James Leasley on my team. And he was like, yeah, you know, you can just find this in the performance report. I was like, no, no. 
show me. <laughs> uh, so yeah, benefits of working with smart people. So yeah, we can see here that the largest contemporary paint on mobile for wire cutter is actually this text block. Um, but it would be different if we switch over to responsive and it's bigger and I'm going to run this again. It may end up being the same item that's the largest contemporary paint, but it changes based on the viewport size, which is why it's important to look at both um, mobile and desktop. Now, as far as algorithm updates go, Google has clarified that it's going to be based on your mobile scores. So it is important to look at your mobile CLS. Uh, let's see, why can't I? Hi, I would like to move over. Can I? Nope, nope, that's the wrong way. It's why can't so frustrating I? navigating <laughs> these and dragging and dropping. Yeah, columns I'm like, brutal. I don't have the ability to, to move over anymore. So, so annoying. Maybe um, if I scroll down? Yeah? No. Anyway, it's up there. What insights do you have to share around which of the new core web vitals you found easiest to have a positive impact on? I honestly think CLS ends up being the easiest because you can watch, actually, let me, let me go back to the mobile version here. You can watch things bounce around pretty easily. And a lot of times the element that's causing the CLS is like a banner that's pushing everything down. So it's just talking to the marketing team and being like, hey, can we put that banner at the bottom? Or um, a lot of times ads will cause it. So say a publisher site and they have a bunch of ads on the side and those ads take a little bit to load. Um, so it will like cause all the content to expand. So if they can recode that in a way so that there's like a block sitting there that's empty until the ad content loads inside of it, that can that CLS score as well. So I think CLS is something that's pretty actionable. Unfortunately, it's only 5% of your score. Um, LCP and uh, FID are worth more of your score. So you can see here, uh, there's not really any bouncing. So you can see that wire cutter is doing this thing where the images as they're loading, it's like a little, little blurry box and then it populates with content. Um, and so, so instead of jumping around, it's, it's not jumping around, but we'll see other clients that when we're scrolling over this, it'll be like loading and then a map will go come in and then the map will jump down and other elements will jump up to the top and everything is moving around a lot and that will make your cls score really really bad oh huh. yeah uh can you walk us through some of the other metrics and talk about the challenges in fixing them yeah so like i said lcp i think this report is super helpful for it. So you can, like I said, you can actually see what element is causing the largest contemporary paint. A lot of times this is an image. So the next step is like seeing what the size is, if it could be compressed in some way. Um, a lot of times maps on store location pages will be at the top on mobile. And if you could push those down, that could help your largest contemporary paint be smaller. Uh, so there's things you can do to make that better um, because it is based on the viewport. Got it. Okay. So if yeah. it's out of the viewport, you're good on a map, a store map. Yes. Yeah. But you, but you have to, you have to think about the fact that like is what is the viewport size for Google bot smartphone? And there, there are some people who think they figured that out, but I, I actually don't know what it is off the top of my head. So that's something important to keep in mind. This may not be the viewport that Googlebot's mobile right. user agent is using. Uh, which of the, of the core web vitals have you found hardest to impact? Honestly, first input delay because I, it's real user metric data. 
And so you have to use total blocking time as a proxy as lab data. And so it's, it's been harder for me to collect information around it. And therefore I've spent less time focusing on it. So it's, it's more been a, a problem of, you know, LCP and CLS being easier to collect data on. So therefore they've become more actionable to me, but that's not a, that's not a good way to look at it. You should be paying attention to it as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, that was something that motivated me to want to have this report so I can at least be pulling in what the real user metric data is for first input delay, because without that, I'm flying blind. I have no idea unless I'm manually going in and looking in, in the lighthouse report, see like what, what are my, what's my FID score? I don't know. I don't know. Wow. That's really cool. Uh, can you talk about the business impact that you've been able to observe after starting to leverage the tool? So as far as business impact goes, I haven't, I haven't had any clients make major changes yet. What I am doing though, is I do have a client who is going through a migration in January. And so we've started collecting this data because their current provider is really fast and um, is really, has really stable pages. And so their scores right now were really good. And we're also looking at their competitors using this similar, um, this similar template. So we're able to see what their competitors are doing as well. And so what our goal is, is to make sure that that doesn't change through the migration because their new vendor has assured them that it's going to remain the same or better as their current setup. So we're collecting data so we can see if that's true. Ooh. Yeah. Huh. I would gladly pay you on Tuesday for a hamburger today. <laughs> No, nobody. Popeye. <laughs> no. Isn't that what uh, what what's his what's his friend, uh, Popeye's friend? So like the new the new company saying, oh yeah, performance is totally going to be better. Give us your money. <laughs> what is interesting though? So the they were this client was concerned about moving to the spender because um, we had showed with one of these kind of sub reports comparing them that one, so our client was switching to this new platform that one of their competitors is also using. And they saw that their competitor had really poor performance scores. Mm -hmm. And then the vendor was like, oh yeah, but here's the thing, they aren't on our new platform yet. We're updating them this week. And so we saw the next week, there's this huge jump in good performance scores for that site. So that I think was what finally sealed the deal for the client. They were like, oh, look, it's true that our competitor is now better than us, or at least like equal with us for most of these metrics. So I think that was a pretty interesting business case. Although, you know, that didn't, that didn't really like make my client more money, but it did convince them to go with this new vendor that hopefully will help them make more money. So let's say I have a crazy React website or Angular or something. Um, is this tool going to help me for any type of platform, any type of site or, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the only thing that's required to run, you know, the script is having JavaScript enabled. So if your site for some reason wouldn't function with JavaScript enabled, it, <laughs> it wouldn't work, right. but I've never encountered such a, such a creation. I've cr encountered the opposite many times, but uh, yeah. Huh. Yep. Yeah, this should be helpful for anyone. And like I said, the, the biggest, I don't know, the most helpful use case I have right now is collecting historical data for clients and identifying page templates that they need to focus there. Um, their efforts on for this algorithm update. A lot of my clients actually have separate teams that are in like um, 
you know, the dev and product side that are working on this. So helping them identify which pages need the most help has been helpful. Are you providing dev fixes that are documented or are you pointing out problems? I'm pointing out problems mainly. So I'll, you know, go in and uh, I guess I close that. Oh no, it's open. I'll show them like, this is the largest contentful paint. I'll show them like on that, that same template. So say the category pages have a problem. I'll pull up four of them and be like, look, this is consistently the largest contentful paint issue. It's this image. They are not compressed there's probably a better way you could do this. And then it's typically up to them to find out what that better way is because I mean, they're a developer, that's their job. I can typically point out the problem to them and they're gonna find a much more elegant solution than Rachel who is not a developer. This is, so this is what I'm, this is a debate that we're having or a discussion on a debate. This is a topic area that we have at work where we're talking about how involved we as SEOs need to be with clients, developer teams. Mm -hmm. And we're coming down on different sides of the issue. Some of us are firmly in the camp of like just pointing out problems. Some of us are saying we need to give detailed direction as to how to fix it. Yeah. And, um, and you're one of the best technical SEOs on the planet. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago, this exact issue, remember? And it makes me want to go crawl under my desk and hide. <laughs> no, 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 but really, right, Rachel? <laughs> I mean, it's like, I yeah. want to know just how smart do I need to be when I'm communicating issues to clients. It's like, I have not done a ton of React stuff. I have not done a lot of JavaScript, you know, like crazy JavaScript sites. And mainly it's because I'm afraid. And Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> so anyway that that was really interesting like do other members of your team are there members of your team who are giving a different level of insight than what you feel like you're comfortable sharing yeah so a couple of i have a couple of thoughts i think it depends a lot on a client's size so if i was dealing with a small local business i would give them specific recommendations i'd be like this is a wordpress site here are some plugins that you may be able to use or maybe some plugins you need to take off your site. I would give them specifics on like, I would do the research on like, hey, I think maybe you should try using this compression thing or this CDN. Like I would give them more specific recommendations because otherwise most of them have like contracted development work and being able to give them specific recommendations on a checkbox to-do list tends to actually get something done instead right. of just being like, make this better. But when I'm working with, you know, giant e-commerce brands and I'm telling their team of, you know, 20 developers how to do their job without having a complete understanding of how all of the elements of their site work together, I cannot give them that kind of recommendation. I mean, I can give them a recommendation, but it's probably not gonna be the best solution. And they might not value your advice because you're wrong. Because you become yeah, right? layers yeah. of technology, right? Because well, I, I encountered an issue, and a lot of times what I'll do is I'll actually work alongside these developers. So I'll be like, so here's the deal. I'm seeing this, like um, I had an issue where the titles and meta descriptions that DeepCrawl was picking up were completely different than what we were seeing when we were, we were inspecting the element. And I was like, this is weird. This is different. Um, and so what I started to realize was that I thought it was a user agent issue. So depending on what user agent was accessing the page, they were being served different content. And I, it was only on some pages. I didn't know. So I had a conversation with their developer. I was like, hey, this is what I'm seeing. What do you think this is? And then they were like, oh, yeah, I think it's because these old pages use this one version of something and these new pages use this different version of something. So we need to fix some things to change that. And that was way more, that was way more effective than me spending, you know, 30 hours trying to identify what sections of the site and doing a bunch of research on like what frameworks they were using because he already knew and he didn't need me to do that and like do his job for him. I just got to have that conversation with him and we figured out what it was. 
So is that basically running their performance tab in real time with him and showing him what's going on and having the scripts below and for him to go, oh, yeah, that's probably the blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes we'll do some more detailed analysis, like we'll be prepping for a call and we'll come prepared with a Google Doc that will also like point out if we start to see like the same the same JavaScript thing that was like caught, like the script is the same on every single page causing the problem. It's like, hey, you know, this script is, you know, the page only seems to be using 40% of this JavaScript code. What is in the rest of that 60%? And why is it on every single page? And just asking those questions instead of being like, why is it like this? Fix it. Like, I just, I find most of the time there's, there's a reason for it. It may just be like, you know, my reason for not building out this report and making it better is like time. It could, it could be that, but it, there's typically a reason for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. So what topic areas are next for you? Like, what are you getting, as you've heard me say before, stoked? <laughs> what are you stoked to learn more about? What are you jacked to learn about? in 2021? Um, SQL for sure, because I love creating Google Data Studio reports, but um, I, like I've said before, I've been limited. So I've gotten to the point that most of the reports I'm creating are via BigQuery, but now I'm dealing with these really, really big data sets and my reports slow to this crawl or I get an error message that it's just like, nope, sorry. <laughs> so I got to find ways to do that more efficiently. I was doing a, a freelance project on the side recently and was working with these excellent, excellently formatted BigQuery um, tables. So like their analytics was partitioned by date and it was just so snappy. They had like the BI engine on and I was like, oh, this is beautiful. And they sent me a couple of queries uh, for over time. And I was like, oh, this is, this is wonderful. I want this for everyone. <laughs> okay. I mean, partitioning by date, just that one simple change uh, changes the speed a lot and also the cost. It, yeah. There's really no reason not to, I mean, maybe there is a reason, but I, it just makes a lot of sense to me to partition by date. Um, yeah. And clustering is something that I'm not leveraging yet, but I feel like I need to, because that seems like a way to, to save a lot of money too. Yeah. Um, so using this, SQL better. That's, that's my early 2021 thing. And also like I could use some more time in pandas and Python. Like, yeah. Yeah. Are you ready for your soapbox moment where you get to jump up on any kind of soapbox you want? And oh. talk about anything that's important to you. Any causes, any passion, side stuff. I know you're really into gardening. That's how we got introduced forever ago. I think you had some killer tomato plants, among other stuff in the garden. What yeah. Else? Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm totally passionate about gardening. Um, I co-run the SEO Garden Slack with Dan Liebson. So we have that Slack where a bunch of other fellow gardening digital marketing people are and so we inspire people to do all kinds of plant stuff um it's a little bit quiet over there right now because i think everyone's sad that it's not really gardening season except for dan who's in southern california and has tomatoes he has winter tomatoes fruit right yeah (laughs) that's weird i mean my understanding of tomatoes is such that I know that they rely a lot on quantity of light, hours of light per day. And so, yes, it's Southern California, but the amount of light they're getting is still winter quantity of light. Yeah, so you can can grow varieties that are from like Siberia that are used to shorter (laughs) light spans and yeah, in cooler weather. That's insane. Yeah, Yeah, crazy stuff. So, So, yeah. I'm super passionate about gardening. Um, I'm like in the process of building a couple more beds over the winter break. Uh, and I'm pumped about that. I've just purchased 
a ton of seeds. So extremely passionate about that. Nice. Jordan, any, any thoughts, questions, feedback? Thoughts? Holy schmoly. I feel like a sponge right now, just like learning everything from Rachel. Um, <laughs> wow. Yeah, no, no, no questions on my side. And I feel bad because I've been hogging the mic today. I didn't mean to do that to you. Not at all, man. Not at all. Cool. Well, what you can't see is shadows right in front of me. And I'm just stoked that he's not jumping up and getting up in my grill, which he seems to do almost every single time we tape. Oh, 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 oh there it is. There we go. <laughs> right. you basically grill, got- you say? Grill? Oh, good boy. You are a good boy. Okay, well, <laughs> this was really sick. Um, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, what else? I... So I would recommend not everyone uses deep crawl. Everyone should. No, I mean, let me pause. <laughs> we talked about <laughs> let me, let me try that again. Um, yeah, so not everyone uses deep crawl. There are other tools you can use to create these kinds of reports. Like I said, um, Jeff at Wirecutter is using Screaming Frog um, to pull the PageSpeed Insights API data and then uploading that manually to BigQuery. That's a solution. Um, some people could get really fancy with it and like automate that kind of stuff. Um, and Screaming Frog does have a post from back in, I think the summer where they talk about using that report. So you can do that manually. Um, and then there's also a node.js library that you can use to pull this and there's no API limitations on that. So we're limited to 25,000 URLs a day. So what I'm doing for a lot of clients is manually configuring lists. So I'll have a URL list that will have, I don't know, 2000 pages with a sampling of pages from different segments that we've set up and then running that same list through daily or weekly. But you can do that on a much larger scale by using the node.js library. Um, And some people like um, Dan Leibson over at local SEO guide, they have a whole setup for using that library, um, which is super cool. So those are two solutions. If you aren't using deep crawl, you can still create this kind of report, um, but it won't be as, it won't be the same process as this. I'm feeling like having a process, whatever that process looks like uh, is gonna be critical by the end of, end of March, I expect for us, we've already built a page speed insights tool. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we're going to need to refactor it a little bit because of our need to get more volume of requests. I think that it's choking at a certain quantity of requests and it's not mm-hmm. 25,000. I think there are, are timing issues. I think we're using an app script sheet to drive it mm-hmm. and it, really should be BigQuery and Node doing the work. Yeah, and even us with this with this solution, sometimes depending on how quick the PageSpeed Insights um, API responds to us, mm-hmm. it sometimes doesn't come back with any data for that day for a URL. Yeah. And that's, there's nothing that we can do about that except for expanding the render timeout window which you know gets expensive and slow and then it starts to slow down all of the the query or all of the crawling that we're doing so there's only so much we can do there um Mm -hmm. using this solution Hmm. yeah awesome so we're going to be sharing lots of links because this was pretty technical um i think people will get a real kick out of it primarily I mean, like the tech is really neat, but I think the coolest part is just the opportunity to be in a Zoom together, right? Have you guys Zoomed together yet? Or how have you, because I know you've been talking to each other about SQL. Is it just on Twitter or in our Slack community? Or how do you guys chat? I, I reached out to Rachel on, on Twitter. Yeah, yeah I, we've talked like a few times in the Slack group too, but mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. Not, not, very, not very much. I'm glad to be on a, on a Zoom call with you. Even though you're like, I see you like kittens. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I mean, I did have the kittens here for a while. Had those foster kittens. They were very sweet. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Alrighty. Well, this was amazing. Rachel, thank you. 
Jordan, yeah. thank you. This was another episode of Agency Automator. Shadow doesn't want it to end. Um, this was really cool. We'll have it up and live soon. And then um, we've got a bunch of cool shows coming up, including, um, I think it's Elias Dabas, maker of Advert Tools. We're going to mm -hmm. be taping that, I think, on Friday. And then coming up in early January, I'm super stoked. Are you ready to get jealous, Rachel? Yeah. Ben Collins. Yeah. Ben Collins is. From ben the name Collins. sounds familiar. He's like Mr. Let's learn Google Sheets formulas and let's learn Google Sheets automation stuff and app script. Yeah, that sounds and great. Like our roots were in uh, Google Sheets and he was one of two classes that Jordan and I took. It was like Ben Collins and David Kravitz from Coding is for Losers. So, and, and I have been, and we kind of jokingly say this, but I've been like Twitter stalking Ben for three years. <laughs> finally, he finally started responding. So it's been pretty great. And uh, yeah, we actually had a Zoom a couple of weeks ago and it was pretty neat because the student had then become the master. Not that I'm like a world of, coding anti-patterns versus like how you should pattern how you should code but uh yeah awesome all right everybody thanks for another episode of agency automators you guys all rock keep automating rachel thank you jordan thank you everybody have a great day peace thanks rachel thanks noah bye, yeah. bye.